Well, the American classic, the summertime feel-good movie, The Sandlot, uh, tells the story of a young boy. His name's Scotty Smalls. He is mother and stepdad have just moved to a new town. It's the 1960s. And uh, the mother's, like, only wish for her son is that the kid would stop playing with um, his erector set in his room and go outside and make friends. And he quickly becomes friends with the other kids of his neighborhood and slowly starts learning the game of baseball. And one day, in, in the middle of playing, they run out of baseballs. You know, a kid hits a home run with their last ball and... Smalls, as he's called throughout the movie, uh, is trying to be in. Oh, I've got a baseball. And he, and he runs home, and he reaches without asking onto his stepfather's dresser, and he grabs a ball that he knew was important to his stepdad, but, you know, it was a baseball they could play. He thought it was ordinary. And shortly after they begin playing, one of the boys hits this ordinary baseball over the fence into a junkyard guarded by an extraordinarily large dog. Just an unreal, they call it the beast. And Smalls panics and he's trying to climb the fence and everybody else is trying to save him. You can't go in there. The beast is huge, get away. And they're freaking out. Why are you panicked over a baseball? And he slowly starts to admit, well, it's not an ordinary baseball. It was my stepdad's. And then, well, who cares about that? Well, it was, it was signed by someone. Who? Well, this girl. This girl signed it. Baby Ruth. <laughs> and that's what the kid said. Are you kidding? That ball was signed by Babe Ruth? And they're like, yeah. Who is she? It's Babe Ruth. He's the sultan of SWAT. The Colossus of Clout. He's the king of Crash. The great Bambino. Those are all the same guy, is what Small's replies is. Yeah, Babe Ruth. And he slowly realizes that the ordinary ball had been signed by an extraordinary, the greatest baseball player of all time, Babe Ruth. And the rest of the movie is them getting it back. You see, Small's finally realizes what he's done, right? He'd heard the puzzle pieces. He knew all of these names, but he hadn't put the puzzle pieces together. This is the same person. He'd heard the stories, but didn't know the truth. He'd seen the pieces, but not the whole picture. He was ignorant. And in his ignorance, he acted for his own self-interest, his own self-gain. I'm going to make friends with these kids, not realizing how much of a value he was risking. And, and on our own, man, we're kind of like that, right? On our own, we hear the puzzle pieces of God's word. We see the puzzle pieces of God's word as they play out in real life, but it's really hard. We don't, we don't always put together the full picture, do we? See, because apart from the Spirit's power, apart from seeing the whole picture in the face of Jesus Christ, we're, we're ignorant. And, and apart from God's ongoing work in our life, we remain ignorant, prone to shrug away from change, difficulty, the truth, growth, prone to plug our ears and say, I didn't really hear that. We're prone to see other people around us as opportunities for our gain. Puzzle pieces that fit our picture. And we're prone to act from our sinful nature. See, our passage this morning is continuing in the book of Acts, but it's one of those passages where Paul is again and again and again saying the puzzle pieces point to Christ. This is the truth. Behold the gospel the message for you that offers freedom, life, fullness, forgiveness, family, adoption, reconciliation, the fullness of God's power, the realness of being able to see God's word, God's world as it is for you, free of charge. And we're going to see that the different characters in the story today, this true historical story, wrestling with do I act out of my own self-interest or do I respond to God's word? So open with me to the book of Acts chapter 24 
If you're watching via live stream, it should appear in a series of um, slides on the bottom, and it's in the words of your bulletin. But I, I, like, a, I like a physical Bible in my hands, and so I'm, I'm encouraging you, bring your Bible to church. It's time. Bring it back. Use it. All right, it's not about that. Acts 24, read with me in verses 1 and following. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way, and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But... To detain you no further, I beg you, in your kindness, hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and one who is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. And the Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him uh, to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues, or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. And now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before them. Other than this one thing that I cried out while I was standing among them. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his knees. needs. Let me pray briefly. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to see you in it. Help us to see your truth, your word to us. And help us to believe and trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm giving us a, a guiding question as we walk through this passage. I'm giving us the question simply, what happened? What happened when Paul was tried before Felix? And as we walk through this, I want to make some observations and help us to see the fullness of what's happening here and how that can inspire and encourage our walk with Christ today. Well, the first thing that happens is Tertullus accuses, and just glancing again at verses 1 through 9, we'll recall this is actually the fourth sermon we've had walking through this same encounter, right? Paul was arrested, Paul speaks out, Paul's put under threat, and now here Paul is finally tried in the midst of it. And so they've traveled from Jerusalem to Caesarea, closer to the ocean, and the high priest, some elders, and a spokesman. And the Greek word here is rhetor, right? Where we get the word rhetoric from. He's a trial attorney. <laughs> we're, we're watching a prosecutor come to the plate, 
We don't necessarily have to think that Tertullus uh, is fully on board with everything that happens, but it's essential to understand the height of the situation. The height of the situation is, to the extent, the high priest himself doesn't want to speak in this court. The high priest himself thinks, if I'm the one who speaks in this court, the governor won't be happy. And I myself will make it this case harder. So let's hire a pro. Let's bring in a, a Greek, a Roman, to walk in and do the work for us. And so they're tried before Felix, the governor. And for Tertullus, this is a day in the office, like any prosecuting attorney. This is an ordinary day. Little did he know this extraordinary encounter would be recorded in God's word and read on the other side of the world 2,000 years later. So verses 2 through 4 give us a customary introduction. This is exactly what any professional attorney in any trial, even in the U.S. today, does. Your Honor, it's great to be here today. I'm really happy. I feel like you're a fantastic judge. And wow, this jury is really great. And we're ready to get going. Let's do it. That's how every trial case begins. And then in verse 5, he gives general charges. He accuses Paul of being a plague. A pestilence so bad that he poisons everything he touches. Everywhere this man goes, everything turns to rot. He's a plague. He's one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. Just ask. Find a synagogue where Paul's been. I bet there was a riot. That's the claim he's making. And he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. We'll find out later in the passage, I, I read it, that Felix knows a fair bit about Judaism. He knows a fair bit about the way, those who follow Jesus. So to say he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes is to remind Felix nothing good comes from that part of the country, right? It's a saying at the time. He's reminding them these are just some awkward offshoot. You can do whatever you want to this man and it's not going to have any effect. That's the claim in general. And then he makes a very specific charge in verse 6. He tried to profane the temple. Which to us sounds like, okay, he tried to profane the temple. But at the time, Judaism is a protected religion, right? It's, it's a religion that's allowed to exist and that was given specific freedoms. They have the freedom to worship was given specific authorities, they're in charge of their temple, and it was given specific promises. Should anybody impinge on your worship or your temple, they are put to death. So this is Tertullus's swing for the fence. Put this man to death. He tried to profane the temple. It's a very serious charge. And likely um, what we're seeing here is a very truncated thing. I know there are some attorneys in the room, and I mean no disrespect, but a trial attorney doesn't talk this shortly, right? It would have been a much longer, long-winded thing, full of reasons and backing, but this is, in brief, the argument made. This man puts everything he touches to waste, he stirs up problems, and he's from nowhere, so who cares? Put him to death. And he did the very thing you said nobody could do. So therefore, examine him. See, almost every aspect of this is ordinary for everybody involved. Almost every aspect of this is commonplace. You know, if we, if we were handy enough and we dug in the right place, I'm sure we'd find a trash heap full of, you know, like the governor's notes somewhere in that part of the world. And we'd be able to see, yeah, that's how trials looked at the time. It's very ordinary. And really what happens is this. When given the next opportunity, Tertullus, on behalf of the Jewish leadership, continues to oppose Paul, continues to oppose Christ, and continues to oppose the truth. I shared an American classic uh, movie, so maybe I'll share a wishes it was an American classic song. Haters gonna hate. Right? This is exactly, at this point in the book of Acts, what we would expect. Haters going to hate. People are going to oppose Christ. Paul is going to be imprisoned. It seems to us who've walked through the book of Acts over the last four years, ordinary. 
However, I think again and again, stories like this ask us two questions. First question it asks us is, where do you stand? Where do you stand? See, reading these accusations again reminds us that the truth of the gospel continually places a fork in the road. And it's continuing to ask you, are you going to walk with Christ or against Christ? Are you going to believe in what he's done? Or are you going to make up ways to think, I don't have to care about this? It's a small time thing out of Nazareth. Who cares? This guy causes problems. I don't have to listen to the truths that he's saying. Where do you stand? Maybe it's asking the question, where is your trust? Or, for what will you stand up and fight? Maybe there will be an occasion at work where you're in a position and you're the one that has to enforce a policy. And the policy at work maybe is directly antithetical. It's opposite to the policies of Christ. For what will you stand up and speak out? Will you be like Tertullus and say, well, I don't really know one way or the other, but I'm going to do what the boss says. Or will you stand up for Christ in that moment? Will you stand for the truth in light of who Jesus is and what he's done? Where do you stand? And it also asks the question, how do you know? Where do you stand and how do you know? Because it's real easy to have really great thoughts. It's real easy to write really somewhat okay thoughts. But how do you know? I think more directly we should be asking the questions when we hear these kinds of accusations again and again, we should be asking the question, how will I respond as I hear the truth this morning? How will I respond to the truth of God's word today? How will you respond? Will you continue forward unchanged? Uh, Russ had this line last week in the Heritage Communion, and it was almost, I, he probably thought of it on the spot. But as he was administering the Lord's Supper, he said, expect, do not expect to return to the status quo. Having now partaken of a fresh offering of the grace of Christ, do not expect to walk away into the status quo, the way everything has been unchanged. Man, that's been ringing in my head all week. Did I return to the status quo? Having freshly heard God's word, is it just same old Andy, same old problems? Is it same old you, same old struggles? Do not expect for the word of God to leave you unchanged is kind of what this passage is saying. It's every time we hear it, it's an opportunity to trust in Christ to deepen our resolve, to strengthen our commitment to be changed by the power of the Spirit. So what happens? Tertullus accuses. Look with me again in verses 10 to 21. We'll see how Paul defends himself. I love, I love verse, uh, verse 10. It's, when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, it's the kind of courtroom, the kind of situation where all is needed is you're up. Just a nod. And Paul's ready. Because Felix is in complete control of this situation. He has the kind of authority where whatever he wants to happen is what is going to happen with armed guards enforcing it. He nods. And Paul replies. Paul does uh, exactly what you'd expect him to do. This is something like his fifth trial that we know of, right? And so he gives a similar customary introduction. I cheerfully make my defense, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation. And you can verify that it's not more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem. See, Paul sets kind of a broad stage for his answer. How much trouble could I have really done in 12 days? Come on. It can't have been that bad. Twelve days. And then Paul begins kind of undercutting everything that they've said. He undercuts the specific charge of profaning the temple in verse 12. They did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd. 
either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Pick a place in Jerusalem. I caused no trouble there the last 12 days. Verse 13, Paul says they can't prove a thing. Go for it. Bring on your witnesses. You can't prove anything. And then in verses 14 to 16, these are the verses that just stuck with me as I was reading and rereading this passage. Let me read verses 14 to 16. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. See, he undercuts the, I'm from nowhere doing nothing. And he says, no, this is about the way, which has got to be one of the most beautiful descriptions of what it means to be in Christ. You're one who's been brought into the way following Jesus, into the way where grace is, into the way where forgiveness, freedom, and fullness are found, into not a chair, but a path, a road to walk down. And then essentially he says, look, I kind of just think I'm a better Jew than they are. It's kind of his response. I worship the God of our fathers. I believe everything. The implication is they don't. I believe everything laid down by the law and the prophets. Pick a part of God's word. I believe it. And let me show you how it points toward Christ. That's what Paul is saying. I believe everything. And I live by hope. I have a hope in God of the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Which, if you're familiar with uh, literature at the time, or if you're familiar with the prophets, essentially he's saying, you think this is a trial? Wait for the resurrection when both the just and the unjust are brought before the throne. You think this man has authority? Wait until the king is on his throne. You think this is what I'm worried about? I'm longing for the day when Jesus returns. And in light of that longing, I take pains to have a clear conscience before God and man. He sets before them his motivation. I live to worship in the way and for the glory of God. He sets forth his character and he sets forward how clear his conscience is. He undercuts all of their claims by essentially stating positively who he is. And then in verses 17 to 21, he responds to the specific charge that puts his life on the line. You think I profaned the temple? Let me talk to you about how I was in the temple. I came, verse 17, to bring an offering. I came to make offerings at the temple. Verse 18, and while I was making those offerings and purified ritually under Jewish law, that's when they found me alone You'll remember from a sermon a few weeks back, what they did was they sealed the temple when they grabbed Paul, thinking they were going to be able to find uh, some, some Gentiles that Paul snuck in to profane the temple, and they came up blank. They found me purified without crowd or tumult. And then he brings in all sorts of doubts. So if you're ever put on trial, this is kind of like a roadmap of uh, your defense, right? You undercut the claims, and then you bring in a whole bunch of doubt. Look, there's a whole lot of people that were there that should be here that aren't here, and so let's keep this truth-seeking mission going. Some Jews from Asia are the ones that actually caused problem. And then he owns up to the one controversial riot-causing type thing he could have done, was his, which is essentially his way of saying, my conscience is clear here. I've put everything truthfully on the line. That's his defense. And really, almost everything in this is now ordinary. It's what we would expect. What's Paul going to do when he's on trial? He's going to speak truthfully. He's going to proclaim who Christ is, and why that's the fullness of life that you should come to. 
and he's going to defend himself against every charge brought his way. It's pretty ordinary. But look how extraordinary it is. He turns every opportunity into the place where he can proclaim the spotlights on Christ. Jesus is what this is about, and that's what you need to know. See, so many aspects of Paul's standing prior to having faith in Christ are put on the line here. Imagine Saul from the end of Acts chapter 7. Imagine you sneak up beside him right after he oversees the stoning of Stephen and say, hey, so in like, I don't know, 15 years, uh, <laughs> you're going to be on trial for profaning the temple. His jaw would still be on the floor. What? I would never do such a thing. Everything is put on the line of Paul's prior identity, but he doesn't become unraveled. He doesn't crumple. He relies on Christ and faces the accusations directly in front of him. Because when faced with the next opportunity, Paul continues to stand firm. Paul continues to proclaim the person and work of Jesus, and Paul continues to proclaim the hope of the resurrection. We used it as our um, confession of faith today, but I want to call our attention again to 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you do have a physical Bible in front of you, flip that way. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and following. Starting at the end of 14. Have no fear of those who persecute and, and oppress you. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your heart, regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Look at that. Always be prepared to be ready to give an answer and a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. You know what I'm convicted by in this verse? How many people walk up to me and say, why are you so hopeful? Sometimes people walk up with random questions of me, but not because of hope. Always be prepared. And then glance down to verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Notice the beauty of the gospel here. Jesus, the, un, the righteous, suffering for the sins of the unrighteous, that's you and that's me, that he might bring us to God. For what reason did Christ die? He died for the unrighteous. He died to bring forgiveness of sins and he died to bring you to God, not just wash you clean and set you on your way. That's the beauty of the gospel and it's those kinds of truths that captured Paul's heart, that captured Paul's life, and that shaped Paul's every day. So this is an ordinary day in the life of Paul with extraordinary truth and extraordinary reality for us all. So if the first section asked us the question, where do you stand? This passage asks us the question, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Perhaps you're reading these verses and thinking, I don't even know what Paul is saying. I have no idea. Andy, you seem like maybe you're kind of sort of nice guy, but I have no clue what's happening here. These are the kind of questions I live for. We would love your elder, your pastor, the ministry staff, the person that invited you here today, the person sitting next to you in the room while you're live streaming, we would love to talk and explain the truths of the gospel. Call the church office. Seek us out. That's why we're here. We're not a pretty building on a corner. We are people engaged in the mission of shining the spotlight on Christ, and we'd love to do that with you. Are you ready to ask questions? Because we're ready to give answers. Perhaps you understand everything that Paul said, but you know, you know that if you were put on the spot, Are you ready? 
to share something about Jesus to someone on purpose? Have you considered what would it take to get ready? Andy, I know I'm not even close to ready. I understand the truths, but if you put a real life person in front of my face and they say, hey, you're a hopeful guy, tell me about Jesus. I don't know what I'd say. Well, now's the time. Get ready. Questions are coming. Or maybe you know some things to say, but you have no idea how to start a conversation. Talk to the staff. Sit in on a Sunday school class and then stand up and ask, hey, if you had to explain that to your neighbor, how would you do that? Put the Sunday school teacher on notice. They need to be ready to answer that question each morning. Now's the time. Start praying. Jesus said the fields are white for harvest, and that was true then and it's true now. Our neighbors, whether they know it or not, long for Christ. Have questions that their answers aren't even close to fulfilling and giving them truth. Now is the time. Are you ready? But that's not all that happens. We get to see the beautiful conclusion of this trial, right? It's not, it's not OJ. It's not like a six-month drawn-out thing, and we watch it and rehash it. No, we get to see what happens here. Look with me again in verses 22 and 23 as Felix defers. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. And you recall, I'll just remind you, Lysias is the arresting officer in this situation. Verse 23, then Felix gave orders to the centurion that he, Paul, should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And I'm, and I'm stopping there, which, which feels like wah, wah. What happened? We got to see the prosecution. We got to see the defense. And then the, the judge punts. He kicks it into next week. Actually, he kicks it into two years from now, if we kept reading in the passage. Well, let's observe a few things first. Felix actually understands the nuances of this conversation. Having a rather accurate knowledge of the way that's what motivates Felix to say, let's see what happens when Lysias comes. Let's kick to next week. Let's kick it down the road and see. Let's wait for the arresting officer. And then he decides, I don't think this man has done anything so drastic that we need to act now, but let's keep him in custody and give him some freedom. See, all of this would have been very ordinary for Felix. Felix was governor for a couple of years and he probably answered trials like this often. For him, this is a speed bump on his road to what he hopes is coming in riches and wealth after he finishes being governor. And we know that what happens from the next few verses, if you just glance at 24 through 27, we know that what happens is that Paul then spends the next two years regularly meeting with Felix explaining the person and work of Jesus. He spends the next two years being visited by friends while he's in custody and strengthening the church. And also, this is when Paul wrote part of the Bible. Are you kidding me? The judge punts and the words that are changing the world and will continue to change the world come to us. That's extraordinary. What a day. What an ordinary day with extraordinary consequences, with extraordinary impact. And can I tell you, that is every day when you're in the Word of God. That is every day when you're in the body of Christ. That is every day when you're worshiping with your family. Every day. Ordinary. Extraordinary. Every day. And realistically, in God's providence, this was the only way to get parts of the New Testament written. Because Paul is not the kind of dude that just sits around. Right? He's a mover and a shaker. You want him to write a book? Lock him up. <laughs> Lock him up. Thank you. 
I love Ephesians. Thanks for locking them up. Thanks for punting. I love 2 Timothy. Thanks for kicking the can down the road. It's extraordinary. And for Paul, maybe it was Tuesday. It's ordinary. Because Paul, gripped by the gospel, is just doing part of the family business. This is what we do. Those marked with the name Christian, this is who we are. We're not the nearly perfect people, the have it all together people. We're the witnessing people. We're the proclaiming, worshiping people. Jesus said it this way in Luke 17, 10. Jesus said, so you also... When you have done all that you were commanded, just pause to think about that scenario. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, here's what you're to say. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. That's it. So this is extraordinary, but it's extraordinary because of God, not Paul. So it can be extraordinary for you because you don't have to be Paul. You just have to be connected with the Jesus and the spirit that Paul was connected with by faith. How does this happen? We've had lots of what to do as I've applied this passage, right? Figure out where you stand, get ready, talk to people, get out there. I I think I'm just struck by the question, how? How do we become this person? These types of people, these types of families, this type of church. What happens because of God's power. So a right response to Felix punting here is pray. God, the next time I feel like I should be going this way and you cause me to stay, help me to see that as my next opportunity. Help me to see that as the next place that you're asking me to grow and become more like Christ. You're asking me to be involved in the work of the church and you're asking me to proclaim the power of Jesus and the work of the Spirit to my neighbors. Because this whole passage boils down to maybe this sentence. Because God redeems and adopts us into his family, we must walk as his people engaging in the family business. See, because if you're from a certain part of the country and your last name is Smuckers, we know what you do, right? The commercial when I was a kid was, it was always like an older brother walking with a little brother and they're pulling a wagon and the older brother is explaining to the little brother and the little brother's like, well, why are we Smuckers? And he says, well, with a name like Smuckers, it has to be good. We make jelly, right? If you're from a certain part of the country and... Your last name is Bush. Wait, that's this part of the country. We have a pretty good guess at what you do. And if you're walking around and the true name on you is Christian, we know what you do. We proclaim who Christ is. That's our family business. See, what happened when Paul was tried before Felix, everybody did what we expected in extraordinarily ordinary ways. And that's what changes the world. So Tertullus accuses, Paul defends, Felix defers, but God's will is accomplished. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this accurate historical account of maybe a Tuesday in Caesarea. And the work of those seeking to bring down Christ, the work of the one, Paul, that you were using then as your servant, to proclaim the truths of who Jesus is. And Father, thanks for the way you providentially led Felix to punt so that we have your word and we have your example through your servant Paul. Father, make us ones like Paul that respond in faith. Help us to be ones that hear the truths of the gospel and don't return to the status quo, but unite what we've heard in our hearts by faith and are changed. And Father, Use your spirit in us, strengthen us, encourage us, challenge us, sharpen us, use us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.